Twenty seven. Okay. I think we're okay. Uh, thank you guys uh, for coming to Boston Comic Con. Thanks for coming to like I think it's is this the last panel of the day? Nope, second to last. Second to last. Ooh. This is like the timekeeper over here. This is the watcher. I love it. Uh, so thanks for the, thanks for coming here. Uh, I'm here with the great, the uncanny, Marv Holman, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you should know I'm very canny. Very canny. You very should canny. need no introduction, but uh, let's just say maybe there's some new comic fans in here. Uh, you know, uh, he's responsible for lots and lots of things that you love. Teen Titans, Raven, uh, Deathstroke, uh, Big Wheel, <laughs> Blade, Bullseye, uh, he had his Nightwing, Bibbo. Uh, I'm, I'm missing a lot. I left a lot out uh, intentionally because we would be here all day. Uh, but in Crisis on Infinite Earth, maybe you've heard of that. Um, so it is an honor to be here with you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this is uh, we had a Marvel not a Marvel writers panel. We had a we had a writers panel a little earlier in the in the convention and. Uh, and it was great to, to get in, inside of a little bit of your process uh, because I, I bet that's a lot, do people ask you a lot, like what, how do you get started or like where do you start in your script and uh, you went into that a little bit, but, um, but is that like one of the most common questions people ask you? Yeah, they, um, so many people want to be writers so I've worked at a whole system to give them the worst information possible so they'll never become my competitors because uh, I don't need them so I give them all the wrong things to do and fortunately they believe me and do it and never get into business you know? and yay me. Um, now, um, I do a lot of writing seminars at conventions and I was sorry that they hadn't asked me to do one here, it would have been fun. Uh, they are literally at Comic Con in San Diego uh, three rooms worth and they have to shut it down because um, they, they have to shut the line down before it's all filled. People really want to learn how to do this. So I talk about the process, I talk about how you put it together, how you start it. My, I used to do a far more complex talk and I realized that's not what they want yet. So it's really, my talk is called What, to, what, to th what You Should Think About Before You Start Writing. Mm. Uh, so it's the all the prep. It's all the stuff that you need to think about before you actually start the physical work on the book, and or what the comic or the TV show or whatever else you're trying to write. Because there's so much you should think about on beforehand. Uh, what you're doing, why you're doing it, what the purpose is, what the characters are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and and that is interesting too because um, uh, you you have a, a new book out related to. Uh, Suicide Squad is the. Right, I wrote the. I wrote the uh, Suicide Squad novelization. And that's not the first novelization. Did Did you also uh, Superman Returns? And I, I I've done Superman Returns. I, last year I did uh, Arkham Knight, uh, but I've been doing either tie-in to novelizations since the early seventies. Um, so uh, it, it's not uncommon ground for me. I just don't do it a lot. Mm. Yeah. You know. And do you, uh, and, and we, were, we were saying in the writer's panel, so sorry, people were at both, uh, but, uh, but it basically, all that prep work and, and what to think about, um, it's, it's not comic specific, it's just whatever you are writing about, whether it's a book yeah. or a play or a comic script or an adaptation. Well, my view, my view is, and people ask me this all the time, because generally what I'm both known for and what I prefer is my comic book stuff. Uh, but I've done animation, I've done video games, I've done uh, books, I've done all sorts of different things, is I don't consider myself a comic book writer, even though 99% of my work is comic books, I consider myself a writer who does comic books, and a writer who does video games, and a writer who does animation. And if all you want to do is one thing, you very well may get tired of it. You may not, you may be repeating the same thing, but by trying different media, by, you know, when you write a book, you're, when you're doing comics or animation or even video games, it's all dialogue. Your scene descriptions 
don't have to be polished. Right. Yeah, and the Yassin descriptions are right to the point of what the uh, what the drawing is going to be. When you do a book, that's completely different because you're writing a lot of that a little, the background information to to flesh out the world and stuff. So each thing helps you keep active and alert and fresh for whatever else you're working on. Uh, and I like to mix it up and just do is just do everything I, I'm capable of doing. And uh, you've given us a lot of great, uh, and, and throughout your career, you've, you've written a lot of different kinds of stories and wrote a lot of horror stories. Yeah. Um, what attracted you to uh, the horror genre and, uh, and vampires specifically? Nothing at all brought me into vampires. Uh, I was assigned. Assignment. It was an assignment. <laughs> Um, but you stayed with it, and well, what happened there, it was, was great. You know, uh, it was, though nobody believes that to this day, I have never seen like the Bela Lugosi Dracula movie. I've seen very few vampire movies. At the time of, that I took over to Dracula, um, I had never seen any vampire movies, and that was the best thing that could have happened because my only information on on Dracula was the Bram Stoker novel, and I love reading horror. Um, visual horror actually is too frightening, uh, if well done. Uh, so I don't tend to do that. But I like uh, when you read it, especially this Bram Stoker novel, because you're making up the visuals and you're making up the ideas in your head. And that's far more horrific in many ways. So if I'm going to do a Dracula series, I don't want to know this person's viewpoint of what Dracula should be, or this person's viewpoint of what it should be, I took it from the guy who created it, and yes. then I could be the first off of that, rather than do a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, which each one gets worse. So the fact that I didn't fall into a lot of cliches is because I didn't know any of them. Mm. And I wasn't, you know, if I had seen all the Hammer films, it's very possible to a Dracula would have felt like a Hammer film. Right. Uh, because that would have been my knowledge. The Bram Stoker novel, was, if it, has anyone here read the Bram Stoker? Good, so you know what I'm talking about. It's, in the, it's not written like a regular book, it's written as letters to people back and forth, right, right. police blotters, uh, news reports. It's not told in the omniscient third person narrator type story, it's all first person from different points of view. And that's what I took from it to make the Tomb of Dracula book about the characters who are facing Dracula, mm. not the supreme evil himself. Right. And, and when you did see Dracula, you never knew if he was lying or telling the truth. And generally, he was lying even to himself, uh, because he was this type of character who was sort of soulless. So, and, uh, and you paint the picture of everybody around him. And, uh, yeah, uh, everybody. What It's more interesting to me how people react to evil mm. and horror and situations than the person causing it. Uh, you can get into that and there's great stories that you can write about that, but if I was going to write a series, I, had, I could not be about Dracula because you'd, you'd wind up with very little to write after a while. You would have solved all the major things, but when you're writing about other people and their reactions to what's going on, that's endless because there are all these different people who are going to react differently and they all then play off of each other as well. Uh, and, and interestingly, uh, you've... So that Dracula was based on something, but then you're, you're known for coming up with these great characters. Did Deathstroke, like, where... Did that Deathstroke fulfill a need for you, like, did, in the story that, that you needed to, uh, to come up with Slade? And, like... <coughs> I'm basically asking, without trying to ask it, like where did where did Deathstroke come from? And so you did ask it. See, I did. <laughs> I, I wanted to dance around it before I, I got I there. There are two characters in my career. I've created a ton of characters um, over time, but there are only two that literally, and I'm using the word correctly here, uh, came to me in one second. Um, without intent, without thinking about it, uh, uh, Deathstroke was the second one, mm. and I knew 
in one second as I was walking home, everything came to me instantly. I knew exactly everything about him. And the previous character to that was Blade. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew him inside and out. I knew what he wore. I knew everything about his emotions, whatever, everything in the world about him. All the others you work up to solve yeah. a need, those two happened to just pop up in my head for no reason that I could even think of. That's great. So it's just a. Uh, yeah. It, I was just starting the Teen Titans, and even I wasn't even into the writing of it yet. Right. Um, which is obvious because Deathstroke, Deathstroke's son is in number one, which leads into Deathstroke in number two. So Deathstroke was created at the same time as the Teen Titans, but I was starting in the thinking process, and I. I am a firm believer that things go on in the back of your head that you're not even aware of, that it's going over ideas and thoughts and then comes out when it's ready. Uh, because if you're writing for a living and you're doing it a lot, you're thinking in those terms whether or not you're actually thinking at that moment. Right. It's, some, it's going on in the back of your head. And those two characters just happen, happen to come out full-blown. Most of the others, the germ of the character is there. And then I, adapt, then I build it from that point on. I, my uncle mentioned that to me when I was really younger. Like, like I sometimes have like a, there's a man in my head that figures stuff out. And I wake up in the morning and, and I know the answer. But it's like, it's, it's just something that stews in the back of your, yeah. your head. Yeah. And then it comes to you. Yeah. Just for no, for no reason. Yeah. And did you, for Deathstroke specifically, did you did you think of the costume and his weapons too, and like what he would look like too, or more, uh, is that more of like? No, I knew. Uh, I, I don't worry part. always about the costume. Blade, I knew for some reason I knew exactly what he was wearing, probably because it was the antithesis of everything at Marvel uh, at the time. He was not necessarily. He wasn't wearing a costume. Right. He, yeah, if he wasn't wearing clothes, the basically. bandolier of knives, mm -hmm. he could walk out on the street in what he was wearing, but it was unique. Everything was unique about what he wore, but not <coughs> something he couldn't walk on the street with uh, wearing. Uh, with Deathstroke, uh, none of that came to me. Um, what I knew was he was blind in one eye. I knew he had white hair. Mm -hmm. I knew he was going to be in his 40s, which was very unusual. Uh, I knew that he was not a villain. And he never was a villain. He was somebody who, his son gets a job in the first one to, to destroy the Titans. He signs up with a group called the Hive. And he's given the job. Before they do it, they check with Deathstroke, who vouches for his son. His son dies. And they say now, well, you vouch for him. You have to complete the contract. If his son had lived, or a thousand other things had happened, Deathstroke would have had no reason ever to have met the Titans. He wasn't a killer, he was, he was a mercenary, right. which meant going into other city, countries and stuff like that, but there was no reason to go against the Titans. And what happened was to solve his problem, to solve the deal he made against his will to help his son out, he kept getting sucked into this because the Titans were actually too good. And he always uh, said he never misses and he always uh, succeeds in what he's going to do. And they kept thwarting him and he kept getting drawn into this. So in my mind, he was a character who, uh, who was no longer in control of himself and found himself having to do stuff that normally he wouldn't even be part of. You know, brilliant character, but that kept him, in my mind, from being a villain. It kept him, it made him sort of a tragic figure in, right. in its place. And I could write that. A villain, you know, twirls mustaches and stuff <laughs> like that. And Deathstroke, I wanted to be, as Slade, a real person. And of these, um, of these characters, uh, you said that those two came from you and that you've, you've built the others up um, more, more so. Uh, are you particularly a proud papa of, of Deathstroke in particular, or is, is, is Raymond, do you, have a, do you have a favorite kid that you sent out there? 
You just answered the question. How, uh, how many parents have a favorite kid, really? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, well, he's sitting next to you, so you know, it doesn't work for you. Um, right, right. Uh, there are characters that I enjoy writing more because they challenge me a little bit more, but uh, there are a lot of different characters. To, uh, again, when you get into it a lot, what you're trying to do is you create puzzles for yourself, and the, and the job that challenges it and then succeeds on the puzzle you've given it, you're very happy with. A story that you may have done a thousand percent better than any other story may not have actually taxed you at all. Mm. It may have been something completely different. So, I, And besides that, I would never say if I had a favorite. <laughs> Uh, you'd be tricky to go on record for that. And then, so uh, when uh, when you're when you're writing your scripts and uh, and giving, uh, let's let's take Crisis. How much uh, is, if any, story are you working out with the artists? Because like Crisis on Infinite Earths is a, such a complex story. There's so many characters. Yeah. And uh, and the way they interact with each other, and you know, we still see a reference today, yeah. even the, like the, well, the crisis, movies. Crisis um, is a fairly unique concept. Uh, it certainly was back then because we had never done a, uh, a company-wide crossover like that that was intended to change anything. Uh, and also, I don't mean to drop but a reboot, and we, we get reboots yeah. frequently now. Uh, now it's, you know, it's Wednesday, so you do a reboot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, right. But um, George was not going to be the artist on Crisis. Oh, I didn't we know that. We had just done five years of Titans, and he wanted to work on Wonder Woman, mm -hmm. and which I encouraged him because I thought he, was a, I thought he would be a great writer. And I was, work, I was working up uh, uh, the outline of Crisis, and I was working up uh, then starting to divide them into all, 12, all, all the issues. And when George and I would get together, because we were still finishing off some Titan stuff, uh, I would tell him what I was doing. And finally he said, I can't stand it anymore. I have to draw this. <laughs> and once he was on, then it became a, a partnership. The, the outline and the structure of the thing was mine from day one, but once he was connected to it, and certainly by the fourth issue, uh, because I had, I had already worked up the rough plots, not even the finished plot, but the rough plots for the first three, uh, it was a complete partnership on that. But George and I had done that on Titans too. We began, when Titans began, I did very tight plots. Um, and George was George knew that he could divert from that because we had done work together at Marvel, so we we were comfortable with each other. But I was doing very tight ones because I knew those characters inside and out. I had been working thought-wise on the characters for five or six months before he got involved with it. Again, everything changed once he did. But I was doing Crisis like that, and then once he came in, it really was able to expand because George and I thought like one person. I mean, it's right. unbelievable. Uh, we could begin and end each other's sentences. So everything was rethought except the structure. Right, so okay. So the details and some All of the, the details, we work together. Right. Occasionally he may come up with something on his own. Mm -hmm. And I always knew if he came up with something that fit within the story, it was going to be brilliant. Uh, because he, took, again, he understood it as well as I did. Uh, even though I had been working on the other material, he understood the character stuff, the character interaction, and my goal was to pr give him as many characters to draw as he possibly can, and, and he, then he would he add did. like 700 <laughs> on top of that, <laughs> yeah, each yeah, panel. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, how many different Superman are yeah. in there? I mean, it was unbelievable when you look at how complex those pages are, and yet how much open space there was at the same time for dialogue. Um, and he's a master. So, yeah, it may have begun with me structuring the book into all 12 issues, originally 10, but then uh, went to 12, because the last two were going to be the history of the DC Universe, mm. where the world was now. We expanded because the actions kept pushing further, so we made it all 12 issues and handled the, the uh, history as a separate two-parter. Um, 
Uh, but again, once we were once once we started, it became a complete partnership uh, on that, and he was throwing in ideas just as I was, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, were, you, were you asked to come up with crisis, or was no, that a no? No, this was one. People ask this, and it, it, because I it have seems to, like I have to ask, weird, I yeah. have to say it confuses me completely because. In the inside front cover of the very first issue, I explained in detail exactly how it happened, and that page has been reprinted in every version. Uh, I no nobody knows it. I guess nobody reads those. I things skipped whatsoever. right to the armor. <laughs> yeah, every time. Uh, but it, it it's been in there from day one, and. Uh, did you want to tidy the mess of all of the different? Parts? No, what happened was I was writing a letter column for Green Lantern, uh, which I was writing at the time, and we had gotten a letter from a fan who said something to the effect of uh, DC continuity doesn't make a word of sense, and I agreed, of course, uh, because it did make a word of sense, um, and. Uh, that day after I finished the letter column, a whole bunch of us were going to a convention in, in Philadelphia. Uh, I got there first, way early, uh, and I was sitting down waiting for everyone else, and for some reason that letter resonated and went through my head, and I started, how would you fix DC continuity? And in all honesty, an hour later when everyone else showed up, I outlined the whole plot to them, the whole oh, concept. Uh, just to find out what uh, what they thought if I was deluding myself or something that are, that are actually is good. Um, everyone sort of liked it, with not sure that anyone in charge would accept it because it was so, such a wholesale change. And the following Monday when I got back from the con, I pitched it to Dick Giordano, who was the editor-in-chief, and then we walked directly into Jeanette Kahn's office, uh, who is the president, and pitched it again, and it was accepted that day. So this was not something that uh, was asked for. It was something that I had pitched. The reason was but it fulfilled uh, a need. I the felt there was I felt there was a major need not only for the continuity, which was less important to me, but the the pure business reason. Back then, uh, you know, today DC and Marvel comics sort of sell the same. One month a Marvel comic may be the best-selling book, the next month it may be a DC book. They all sell around the same number. The top-selling books sell this much at both companies, the, the bottom ones sell this much at both companies. Back then though, with the exception of the Teen Titans, um, the Marvel comics were selling like 550,000 a month and wow. the DCs were selling about 50,000 a month. And except the Titans, which was selling close to the Marvel numbers. And my thought was, DC has so many great characters, but because there was a number of years where the books weren't well done, nobody, none of the real Marvel fans um, uh, were willing to give it a try. And my thought was, if we reboot, uh, and when I'd ask the Marvel people, they say, we don't understand the DC Universe, uh, there's so many Supermans and so many Batman, you know, we, it, we just don't get it. And, you know, later you got complaints from the, some of the DC fans saying, we understand them. I said, yes, but there's only 50,000 of you. Uh, and there's hundreds of thousands of comic book readers out there who are ignoring it because they don't understand. So the idea was Crisis could start it all over with single versions of every character. And if in the future you want to may add more, that's fine. But let's start on a baseline that everybody can get behind. And if you look at Crisis, my feeling was that a lot of people actively did not like Superman, Batman, or Wonder Woman. Mm. Everyone knew those characters. There was no way not to know them, <coughs> if only from TV. So you certainly knew Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, and that and people did not like the characters at that particular time. So my, if you look at Crisis, none of those three characters appear in the early issues of the book mm -hmm. at all. What my goal was to show how 
the other DCU, all the other characters you don't even know about to any great extent, how good they could be. That's why Superman, and Batman, and Wonder Woman don't appear until like issue six right. or something like that. Um, and I deal with Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman because you're waiting to find out if they can do anything. And the first five pages of the book, of the issue one, where they go to the criminal world, the, uh, we're on the uh, Earth 3, which is run by supervillains, who are essentially Superman, Batman, Wonder right. Woman, Green Lantern, all, I mean, have all the same powers, and our villain wipes out their entire planet in five pages. So that tells you up front Superman is helpless against this guy without having to have Superman in it. Yeah. You know, right. So it was very deliberately constructed to um, show how good the DCU is without Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman, and then bring them in and really freak out the readers because we're going to show them as good as they can possibly be. And the ultimate version of them will yeah. survive and yeah. live. And, and what, uh, and, and so, like, would you think that the, just the Marvel fans just understood completely everything that was happening in Marvel but just didn't understand DC? Like, they, well, you, you know, didn't have to know a lot about Marvel yeah. to read the books. You just knew all the characters existed on the same planet. Right. There wasn't this, see, DC was created in 1938, essentially, with Superman, time, yeah. with Superman. Marvel was created in 1961. Uh, DC was a company run by six to eight editors, and all of their books were different. And that's the strength of DC, was that the DC books weren't all the same. Right. Marvel, Stan wrote everything and created everything so that he connected the characters because he was doing everything. Um, so they came from different philosophies. It was much easier for uh, teenagers reading Marvel back in 1961 to understand all those characters. And it was very hard to understand why there were multiple versions of all the DC characters. So, you know, that. Anyway, you know yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. And um, and we we talked about it on the other panel too. Is that you you've seen your characters on your your characters are on the most uh, televised and in the in the movies and and they use uh, they use the the different Earths even you know in the CW verse yeah. and and that's how we even get the Supergirl. Um, in, into uh, the, the new CW TV universe, and uh, this is, that must be just great fun for you. Is that, I know oh, it's, you enjoy it's the great. When, when they're well done, you know, you look at what uh, uh, Arrow did with um, Deathstroke, and that was phenomenal as far as I understood. I didn't care that he was Australian instead of American. He was still <laughs> the next soldier who was mean and good and powerful and everything else. Uh, he was a great character, and uh, Man of Bennett did a beautiful job with him. Uh, and you look at some of the other characters, and uh, I've been very lucky um, to have a, a, a lot of them. Now with uh, Supergirl, with Callista Flacco playing Cat Grant, which is one of mine, or uh, you know, so many of the others out there, it, it's a lot of fun. And even there, like Flashpoint seems to be coming up in the in the TV universe and that has uh everything always goes back to barry it seems <laughs> well he, he was the first silver age character and um i think you know it, it sort of logically stems from him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, does anybody have any questions oh right now <laughs> sure if you want you, there's a microphone back oh, there sure. Yeah, please, if you have questions, stand by the microphone. My hearing is not very good, so I could use it amplified. So, yeah, I know that uh, you wrote the Teen Titans comics, and I, to be honest, I, I'm more familiar with the cartoon, which takes a lot from your run, like it's using a... Deathstroke, although his name is Slade in the cartoon because censorship for some reason, but anyway. Um, but there's one of the thing about your characters I want to know about. Between the character that you created and something that was around at DC before you did Titans, who is the more evil of the two characters? Death, I'm sorry, not Deathstroke. 
Trigon or dark side? Who is the most evil? Trigon? He's Satan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, dark side's the leader of a very dark, powerful planet who wants things done his way, but you don't beat Satan in terms of evil. <laughs> you know? Okay, I just wanted to know because Darkseid is pretty evil. Oh, he's pretty, but he's very and very powerful. But he also was a ruler of a world, and uh, it's a different thing. I wouldn't want to uh, know either of them, and I wouldn't trick or treat at either house <laughs> because there ain't no treat. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm sure you've heard this uh, a lot before at various conventions, but your run on Teen Titans is why I got into comics in the first place. Thank you. Yeah. And I always appreciate it. I really do. Yeah. Uh, you you write um, team stories so well, and I was just wondering, is there a trick uh, that you could sum up in a reasonable amount of time on how you get uh, enough characters where there's not a single protagonist, give them enough spotlight and still have everybody seem like a well-rounded character. Well, in terms of writing teenagers, it's easy because I never grew up. You know, I got older, but I never grew up. I'm still 12, you know, so I'm not quite a teenager yet. Um, in terms of creating characters, uh, I actually, uh, and it's too complex to go in here right now, and I did it before, I created charts that create character that compared each character to the other, and I did triangles and stuff, and emotional as well as power, the things that made them the same, the things that made them different, uh, etc., like that, so that I was creating a family. I didn't want to do the Justice League, which is just was seven disparate characters, or the Avengers, which was I don't know how many different characters, but they weren't related. There was no purpose of them staying together. They came together in between other jobs. Yeah. And with the Titans, I very deliberately wanted to create a family. You know, I always found it funny because um, a lot of fans thought we were doing the DC version of the X Men, and I was never an X Men fan. Well, I always said from day one I was doing DC's version of Fantastic Four. That was a family. Uh, not to following anything that they did, but uh, taking, some, uh, taking the lesson of a family that isn't going to split up. Even though in the FF they split up every other issue. Uh, uh, but family stays together even when they're apart. And I wanted very much a family thing, so it was important to me to come up with characterizations that would make them very different, make, give them points of complete argument, because nobody fights better than family, where they get into your face. Um, and it was very important to me to make sure that the characters were unique on their own. So you work out all their own characters, and you work out how they re relate to all the other characters. Uh, when I do the seminars, uh, I do things like, what does this character think of this? What does this character think of that one? What is the, you know, each one down the line, because what you think of your closest friend may not be exactly what your closest friend thinks of you. <coughs> Everybody has different, and that's, and when you work that out in advance, the characters stay consistent as real people should, and you have an idea of how they'll react to most situations and where, where they can get away with stuff and where they can't get away with stuff anymore. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure we heard you consulting maybe on the script. Have, you have to even you, speak louder. Okay. Um, supposedly next, one of the next DC animated movies is the Judas Contract with Titans. Do you That's think what I heard. Uh, they don't tell me anything. <laughs> they don't so. tell you. Do you no, think no, they either no. will or should take the same R-rated approach that they did? I'm sorry. Say that again. Do you think they either will or should take the same R-rated approach as Killing Joke to it? Take the same. Well, R-rated. R-rated. Uh, they they I don't. I. I didn't write an R-rated comic. I don't see why. Uh, that I, it's a hard PG-13, you know, <laughs> sim, uh, specifically between uh, Deathstroke and Terror. 
which I'm still shocked we got through uh, the co comics code. I don't, I don't, I don't think. I think we blew out their brains and they didn't realize what we were doing. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think it needs to be an R-rated thing because nobody really super gets murdered or anything or eviscerated. Uh, Terra dies, you know. Um, I'm sorry, spoiler warning. Um, yeah, that's about it. Hi. Uh, I wanted to know um, what you think about what other writers have done with the characters that you created. I have made a policy since I wrote to my Dracula never to read anybody else's version of my of anything I've created um, for multiple reasons. One, I don't ever want to have to tell them what I think uh, if I don't like it. Uh, but more importantly, I didn't ask Bob Kane, who created, you know, the Batman guy, um, if I could change Robin into Nightwing. I didn't ask Jerry Siegel if it was okay to add a, a girl like Cat Grant to Superman, who was interested in Clark Kent, but not Superman. Mm -hmm. It's important that I did what I felt was right, and. Once I'm off a project, I don't have the right then to tell the next writer to do something only because I did it. They have to do what's right for them, otherwise all they're doing is repeating my stories. And that's never good for a book. Um, so uh, I just don't do it. The other thing is, and this is a writer thing I'm sure, when I create the character I create this speech pattern. And it's in my head. I know how every one of those characters speaks. As far as I'm concerned, since I created them, I'm correct. Um, I know how they think. I know how they will react to certain situations. There is no way another writer can get into my head. And therefore, the character will never be exactly the way I created it in the first place. The same way my Robin, uh, then later Nightwing, could never have been a version that uh, Bill Finger would have ever written, or Danny O'Neill, someone a lot closer in, in my time period. So it doesn't pay for me to ever read the stuff. If I have to do like I did with Titans, I have to come <laughs> back for a couple of issues with Jeff Johns, he asked me to, I'd read only the issues that would bring me up to that storyline. And I, and I never read anything again afterwards. It's just, it's just fairer for me. Other people do it differently. Thank you. So I need to rewind to uh, uh, 94, 95, the end of Titan's Hunt. Uh, Raymond became evil, like pure evil. Yeah. Died, came back, and was even more evil. That's what I grew up with. Do you prefer Raven good or pure evil? Like try to be evil. I'm 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 not I'm not hearing your actual question. Sorry. So, do you prefer Raven as a good guy or as a bad guy? I I think she was an awesome bad guy in the '90s. I I I think that Raven is someone who one a I one a or well, one I believe is a good person, and she has an evil inside her, and like all of us, if we don't watch ourselves, we could do things wrong. She has to be even on more guard because she could do, turn into Red Raven or White Raven. Well, White Raven was the absence of evil, but Red Raven again. So she knows that she has to um, totally control herself. And that makes her a real tragic character. And that's great to write. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And you have a, a Raven book coming out? I have a, a new Raven book coming out. Um, in September, next month, a six-part miniseries that's one of the weirdest, creepiest stories I've written. Hi. Um, I just want to start out by thanking you for your contribution to comics. Oh, thank, thank you. General. Thank um, you. Yeah. A nice background. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a Titans or a Tomb of Dracula story, but was there ever like a story that you were really excited about to pitch? and then you pitched it and it didn't go through? 
I have a I have a lousy memory for things that are, that don't happen. <laughs> no, seriously, because there were a lot of times I'll pitch a story and they'll say no, and I forget about it completely uh, because I haven't done it. I have a pr very good memory from almost all the stories I've written. Not all. Occasionally, people have me sign stuff. I go, I did this, <laughs> uh, but um, you know. Uh, so I tend not to remember a lot of that stuff, and I think it's always best not to dwell on the bad stuff or the or or, or that type of material anyway. So um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure they have been. I just don't recall them. Anyone else have any other questions? Is um uh, and uh, you teased the other day too. If you don't mind repeating, uh, there's. You, you found a new way to approach Raven, or you've, you found a, a key that's going to be showing up. Do you mind yeah. talking about that? Yeah, OK. Um, Raven, Raven uh, I assume you're all familiar with the Titans. If you're not, this will be as incomprehensible as DC's multiple worlds. <laughs> um, the, Raven's in, the origin of Raven is Raven's mother ran away from home and joined a cult that turned out to be a demon cult, brought in, they brought Trigon into our world, and he grabbed her, uh, the mother, uh, raped her, again, I don't know how the comics code missed that, um, and Raven was born and brought away immediately. Uh, and that's what I wrote for, since 1980. Uh, considering I've written Teen Titan stories endlessly, <laughs> including a Raven miniseries just a few years ago. Um, this time, because I was going back to Raven's beginning, she's a little bit younger uh, than we, we've seen her before, uh, I asked the question, which I had never asked before, why did Raven's mother run away? Which, what's the catalyst of what Raven's mother was going through that caused her to run away from home. Now, you think about it for a brief time, and you realize, well, she ran to a demon cult. What's the opposite of that? The thing that she was running away from, if she was running to a demon cult, her family was very religious. Honestly, truly, nicely religious, but very religious and she was rebelling, as most teenagers do in one fashion or another, towards something completely the opposite. And that brings in a whole new dimension for Raven that she's never had to deal with before, a religion and a belief in religion that she's never had to deal with because she's always dealt with these mega villains and all this other stuff, but not the personal. So she's now in a situation, she did not realize that she had an aunt because her mother never talked about her family. She ran away from it, she wasn't gonna talk about it. So she's now living with her aunt and her family, and it brings in a completely new uh, baseline for Raven to deal with. Meanwhile, the creepiest story I've ever done is the villain, is the evil part, and the thing she has to deal with and it's, so it's a very personal story for her as she's learning to accept something she's never even considered and meeting family that she never knew existed. Very cool. Any other questions? Yeah. So just in general, I was wondering, would you say it's more difficult to write for characters that you've created or more difficult to write uh, an adaptation or a character that somebody else has already made? Because you still have to have be consistent even if you don't necessarily consult the previous authors with the oh, way that characterization is no. meant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's difficult to write. It doesn't matter whether you're writing your own character or not. You have to be honest to the character. And the only leeway you have with characters you create is that you may, like I was fortunate, there weren't 47 Titans books out there. So I didn't have to worry about Raven acting this way in this book, this way in that book, that way in that, you know. 
there's what 18,000 Wolverine books or used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, there's all these books, multiple books of the same character. That's harder to write than anything because then you're writing uh, at odds with a lot of other writers. Uh, but when I was doing Superman, there were only two Superman books, and I was allowed to write Superman my way. Julie let Carrie write it his way on his book, and me write it on my way on mine. And with the Titans, it was the only book, so I could develop it the way I want. So it's not harder to write either your own characters or other ones. It's hard to always know what these characters should do and how they should act and how you construct the story to make them work. If you notice in the Raven story, that I just mentioned to you, it's a very personal story. I got deeply into who the character is and who her, who and what her uh, actual relation to people that she didn't even know existed was going to be. So it makes it personal. And I like to always write stories about people. So with Raven and Starfire and Donna, you wrote sort of at a time where there weren't a lot of really great female, strong women. You were writing them. So, I mean, was that something you set out to do when you sort of put the team together? Or were you just writing great characters? Um, when I was on, uh, I don't know how many people know my Tomb of Dracula material, but uh, before I, I did it for eight years, uh, before I did Titans, and there was a very strong female character in there named Rachel Van Helsing, who was the first very real flawed female, totally. I mean, she was as crazy as all the guys, and, but all in a good way, because people back then tended to write the women characters as, uh, put it this way, the female character lead in the Fantastic Four was the invisible girl. <laughs> that says it all. And I was going to write a strong female character. And that just translated over to the Titans. We wrote, we created three very different women. And George, in his infinite ability, was able to create three different body types as well. Uh, it took a few months to get into that, but once he did, all women always looked like Betty and Veronica, you know. Uh, and George made them all individuals. So each one had their own look and their own way of acting and body type. So, and that's how I wrote them too. We were writing people and not the cliches that uh, the comics had had. You know. And oddly enough, I learned with Tomb of Dracula, we, got, we had a huge female readership who really loved seeing a more realistic woman being presented than the comic book cliches. They didn't want Invisible Girl, they wanted Starfire, they wanted Raven, they wanted Wonder Girl. Characters that had problems but were real, you know, within a superhero universe, of course. Yeah. Very cool. Well, we're just about out of time, and uh, thank you guys for all those awesome questions. Are you still going to be at your table? No, I closed the table up. He's done. Sorry. He's um, done. But we all owe Mr. Wolfman that. Round of applause. And for all of us, for our students, we're lucky enough to be able to get new comics and also the Suicide Squad on the mobilization from Thank you, everyone, for checking out. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.